Brett McKay here and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. Well, I'm back after taking a hiatus. Uh, my wife and I welcomed a new baby into our family. Her name's Olive Scout McKay, calling her Scout. Baby's doing great. Mom and dad aren't getting much sleep, but that's okay. I'm really excited about today's show. Today, we're going to be talking about making things by hand, trying to be self-sufficient, doing things, trying to fix things on your own. Uh, it's something we've talked a lot about on theartofmanliness.com. And our guest today has written a book about his experience um, trying to make things by hand, um, trying to live by a DIY ethos. Uh, his name is Mark Frauenfelder. He is the editor uh, of Make Magazine, a popular magazine about how to make things. Uh, he's also an editor and, uh, and founder of boingboing.net, a popular web blog uh, that I enjoy checking out. And his recent book is called Made by Hand, Searching for Meaning in a Throwaway World. And we're going to talk with Mark about his experience um, trying to be a bit more self-sufficient, trying to do things on his own and making things by hand, and the benefits that men can get from trying to take on a DIY ethos in their life. In their life. So stay tuned. All right, Mark. So let's talk about the genesis of your book. The story is really interesting because you and your family decided to move to the remote, some remote island in the South Pacific to escape the craziness of modern life. And both you and your wife, I guess you honeymooned there, right? Before? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't really a honeymoon, but, but uh, we had just gone there on a vacation before we had kids, okay. which is kind of like a, a honeymoon, <laughs> you know, before you have kids. I know you just had a a baby, so yeah. you realize how much life changes after you have kids. Definitely, and and so when you were there, like when you were there with your wife on the vacation, you're like, "This is a great place," and you were kind of remembering it that oh, I was a laid back lifestyle. We can go there, and it'll be what we want. Um, but then you get there, and the idea of living on the island was actually nicer than the reality. And you, so you decide to head back to the states, just like four months later, right? Was that how long? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Um, <laughs> And there were, you know, a few reasons why we why we ended up leaving a lot sooner than we thought we would have. Um, we wanted to stay a year at least, but uh, one of the things was uh, the the healthcare there was really a lot worse than we mm. had expected. So we ended up getting like uh, my two and a half month old daughter got pneumonia, and uh, it was really hard to deal with that because they didn't have the right kind of medicine. We had to have it shipped in from New Zealand. Wow. We all had lice, and uh, I got ringworm, and I got really bad bronchitis. Oh, boy. My wife got really bad toenail fungus that was just, like, really nasty. Oh, and man. I, and I had ringworm. So, anyway, that was one of the things. But really, the, the hardest thing was the, the uh, social net, losing that social network of, that we had built up over a lifetime. It's kind of like, you know, uh, the, the old story about, two fish talking to each other and, and one of them mentions something about being in the water and the fish asks, what's water? <laughs> it's the same with us. We just had the social network. We were so used to it, we didn't even realize we had it until we didn't have it. And so that was, that was the hardest thing. And, and the people who lived on Rarotonga were nice. They were friendly and um, we got along with them, but they knew that we would eventually leave. So they yeah. understandably didn't want to invest that time into building a, a relationship with us if we were just going to leave as, you know, we eventually did. Yeah. So, okay. So it sounds like uh, lots of health problems. You lost that social network, but the, the trip, the experience wasn't a waste because while you were there, you learned that one of the things you enjoyed doing was preparing coconuts with your daughter. So can you explain the coconut preparing process? Because I thought this was really interesting. So what, in, yeah. what what goes into preparing a coconut? Yeah, it's really, it's it's it was really fun and, and something that we all loved doing. When a coconut grows, like the coconuts you buy in a store are these hard shelled things, but when they fall off of the tree, they have this like thick fibrous skin on them. And I, I was vaguely aware of the fact that they did, but I, I thought maybe there were two different kinds of species of coconut or something, but no, every coconut's got this thick skin and you have to husk it off. And so you have to learn how to, how to do that by putting a, a stick in the ground. So it's sticking up like kind of like a spear point tip up in the ground. And then you poke the coconut and you peel this tough husk off of it. And then you have to chop it with a, with a machete in a certain way. And then 
So the landlady, we, we had rented a, a little house on the beach there, and she came by and she saw me like jabbing at a coconut with a screwdriver and, you know, pounding on it with a rock. And she said, you need to get a coconut scraping bench. And I'm like, well, what is that? And she said, well, you have to make one and you have to like first go to the junkyard and get a leaf spring from, from a car and then take that leaf spring over to the metal shop. This guy runs a metal shop and he'll grind it and serrate the edge for you. And then you can take that over to the carpenter and he'll install, he'll make a little bench for you and install the the sharpened leaf spring in there for you. And I was like thinking about all these these things she was telling me. And she said, or you could just use mine if you want. I'm like, (laughs) all right, I'll use yours. That sounds good. And so uh, basically you you straddle this little bench and take a coconut shell and scrape it on that serrated edge and the the coconut uh, pulp inside, the meat of it drops into a little bowl. And so we had coconut trees growing on the property that we were renting it would just fall out of the tree, like one or two a day, which was a lot, actually. It built up, and so mm-hmm. I would just scrape it, and we ended up like using it in everything. We would make coconut scones and coconut pancakes and make coconut cream and put that on the fish that we would buy from our neighbors who would go fishing and doing that kind of all-day thing and making our own tortillas and making our own uh, spaghetti noodles or linguine by hand, all that kind of stuff. It would take a really long time to do all of that stuff as, you know, compared to picking up something that's ready to go at Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or something. But it was a lot of fun. The whole family got involved in it and we really loved it. And I thought to myself that this is something that I'll always want to do, no matter what kind of life I live or where I live. This kind of you know, family activity of getting involved in something that is so important to your life, eating three times a day, having kind of control over doing it and being part of the process of of having the food. And so that was like a big light bulb that went off in my head. Okay. So you basically, you've discovered being self-sufficient where there was something fulfilling about that. Um, and coconuts, harvesting coconuts led to that, which led to this idea that I guess led to your book. Um, how can I do stuff by myself, be self-sufficient, um, in other aspects of my life? Um, so, I mean, when you got back to the States, like you had that light bulb, did you decide then, well, I'm going to write a book about this, or did you decide I'm going to look for more experiences, um, like I had on the Island with the coconuts. And then the book came from that. What happened? That. Yeah, I think it was it was uh, the second of those two things, plus the fact that I got a job at uh, Make Magazine, which was uh, uh, the uh, it was started by a company called O'Reilly. They're a technical book publisher, and one of the founders named Dale Doherty. He gave me a call and and uh, knew about my work at Wired Magazine and Boing Boing, and said, "I want to put together a prototype magazine." That's kind of like a gen- general interest DIY how-to project magazine. And that idea really intrigued me because of my experiences on Rarotonga. So I met with Dale and um, we put together a prototype for the magazine and um, people re- responded really well to it. And I really still wasn't that much of a maker of things when we put out the magazine. But after I did and I started meeting all these people who were making amazing things out of wood or electronics or metalwork or, or whatever and learning what kind of people they are and how much reward and fulfillment they got from doing it, that made me want to start experimenting it with, with those kinds of things myself. And then combined with my experiences on the island, I thought the idea of kind of do-it-yourself food would be something that would really work for me because um, – you know, everybody. So if I get more involved in in the the process of feeding myself and my family, that would be something that would be fulfilling to me. And uh, it, it turned out to be, even though a lot of my experiments ended up being disasters. <laughs> you know, we'll get to that in just a bit. Um, so you, one of the things you keep on saying um, is how doing stuff by yourself, on your own, doing DIY, um, gives you a lot of meaning. And in fact, the, the subtitle of your book 
is called Searching for Meaning in a Throwaway World. I mean, can you elaborate on that? I mean, what is it about doing something by hand um, that makes it, that provides meaning in our lives? I think that there are so many aspects of modern life that are out of our control. We can't really do much about the economy. We can do very little about politics other than vote. And um, the results are usually unsatisfactory. People are, almost everybody happy with, with Congress. There's not, uh, we, we have to rely on large institutions for education, um, all, all those kinds of things. And so, people get this kind of learned helplessness of just accepting the solutions that are given to them. And once you start to take a little more control of the, the world, the, the human made and, and uh, maintained world around you and, and become a participant rather than a, a consumer, it's, it's infectious and you start to develop a sense of self-efficacy mm-hmm. that crosses over from one, one, one uh, knowledge set to another. So if I, am, if I have a problem with the home thermostat and I need to replace it, and whether I'm successful or not, I've learned something about it. And then it makes you feel like you want to deal with other problems that happen or other opportunities that you have. You feel like, well, you know, I'm willing to give this a try. And um, that having that kind of, you know, even a small degree of control over the way you live and being able to solve a problem that you have rather than paying someone else to solve it for you is something that for, for me it was was a, a great feeling and has changed my life um, just yesterday I well, well like three days ago I noticed a whole bunch of water pooling up underneath the washing machine and I I had it had been I kind of noticed it in the back of my mind and I didn't know what was going on it was in the garage and finally like I listened and I heard this sound that was like water leaking. And so it ended up that there was something leaking inside the washing machine. And my first inclination is to find to buy a new washing machine. <laughs> but instead I like turn the, the source, the tap uh, off that was leading to that, you know, that the hoses that lead to the washing machine. And, um, and I noticed that the sound went away. So something's leaking inside the washing machine. I ended up like figuring out how to take it apart. I took the wrong pieces off at first and everything. But finally, I found a little plastic water inlet um, valve with solenoids on it that had a hairline fracture and water was spraying out in a fine mist. And so I went online. Thank, thank God for the internet being like this index yeah. parts store. And I found a part and it was like $30 delivered in two days. And I got it, and yesterday I replaced it and put the new um, water inlet valve in, and the thing works. And it's like, it, before I wrote this book, there's no way I would have been <laughs> able to do that. I wouldn't have had the, the knowledge or, or the, the, the tools that I'd need to do even. And it would have been an expensive thing, either, either getting someone out here to repair it or, you know, my, my default solution, buying a new washing <laughs> machine. Well, that's awesome. Um, I love how you mentioned that. Yeah, it gives you a sense of meaning and control in a world where we don't have much control uh, over our lives because these large institutions are handle a lot of the, the heavy lifting in, in society. And what I what I found in, found interesting too. What I find interesting too is that it seems like even uh, a lot of our like the goods we use on a daily basis are being designed in a way now that we can't tinker with them. Like, you know, modern washing machines. Like I have this washing machine, it's a Samsung washing machine. And it's like, this got this fancy computer um, where it tells like how much water it exactly needs. And like, if that thing broke down, I don't know if I'd be able to fix it. Um, Or like, you know, you talk about like newer cars, even they're designed in a way so that we have to go to a, you know, an authorized mechanic the dealership to get it fixed because there's some kind of computer involved or like I've even seen some cars or heard about some cars where they actually put like plastic over the engine. Like you open up the hood and all you see is plastic. Um, Yes. That's like Matthew Crawford, the author of shop class, shop class as soul craft said, 
when you lift the hood on a car, there's another hood. Yeah. <laughs> and, that's, I mean, and this is something that happened to me last week. The, the check engine light on my car came on. I hate those check engine lights because they don't tell you what the problem is. Yeah. You have to take it. So I took it to a garage, a Pep Boys, and said, could you check it out and see what the problem is? And so they looked and they said, it's your, your smog pump, something that like it, it is with the exhaust system. And so they um, said, Let's, uh, we'll, we'll figure out what's going on with it. So then a couple of hours later, they said, you know, your smog pump is fine. There's no problem with it. What's, the problem is the computer that, uh, that deals with the smog pump and senses it thinks that the smog pump's oh, not working. And so they did a smog test on it and it failed the smog test, not because there's anything wrong with the emissions, but just because the computer is giving the wrong information. Oh, they have to plug that, you know, that diagnostic port in where they do a smog test. And so they said, you have to take it to a Volkswagen dealership to either, you know, reprogram or replace the computer. And uh, that's, that's like frustrating. And, and um, you're, you're right, today's consumer technology is very... Uh, user unfriendly. They have all, you know, no user serviceable parts inside labels on them. And uh, the parts are glued together often rather than screwed together. So you couldn't even open them if you wanted to. And they're surface mount components instead of discrete components. If you wanted to try to replace them, you'd have a hard time. I remember when I was really young, we had TV sets that had tubes in them. Mm -hmm. And when the TV started to go wonky, if the picture was bad, my dad would take the back off the TV and just pull the tubes out. And you could drive down to the local drugstore and they would have a tube testing machine. And you'd pl plug the tubes into these sockets and a little needle on a meter would tell you whether or not the TV, the tubes were good or not. And then you could just buy the tubes and take them home. Now, if a TV breaks, you just throw it in the trash and buy a new one yeah because you know one thing is they're a lot cheaper but the other thing is you couldn't fix it even if you wanted to yeah and i mean i guess the reason why companies do that because you know you have to buy another tv right that's more money for them um because you have to buy a new tv instead of actually yeah. fixing it and what's interesting i think you actually mentioned this in your book or might have i might be confusing shopcraft as soulcraft but like back in the day when they created appliances or m machines um companies did so with the in with the intention that the user would actually repair it themselves, like that you could buy parts, right, from uh, for your John Deere tractor and fix it or your television set or your vacuum cleaner. And yeah, it's just so frustrating because you can't do that anymore. Even, even if you wanted to, it's hard to do that. Yes, exactly. And that's why um, some, some of my friends will only buy used appliances for their, for their household use, like in, industrial juicers and all like industrial and and uh, kind of professional grade equipment because those are meant to be uh, uh, easily repaired. You know, there's like little access panels and parts that come out easily. So like they'll buy um, an, 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 a, a commercial grade espresso maker because they know that they'll be able to replace the parts rather than the kind of plastic one you would buy and as soon as it's broken, you just say, oh, well, time to throw it away and get a new one. Okay, so you mentioned the espresso maker, uh, which reminds me um, of my next question is, are there, let's talk about some of the projects that you highlight in your book. Um, the espresso maker was one of them, uh, which is really interesting. Um, was there, was that one you really enjoyed or is there another one that you really enjoyed? And was there a project that just really frustrated you, um, but in the end was rewarding? Yeah, I, I think um, they uh, they all had different levels of frustration, but the one that um, I think was was frustrating at first, and then was rewarding. And I might not have talked enough about the rewards in the book because the reward didn't come until after I wrote it. Was beekeeping? Um, I wanted to start keeping bees so that I could collect honey and and honeycomb wax, and I had a hard time because the uh, the bees were absconding from the, the hive. The, what we did, I, I worked with this guy um, who's like the leader of a beekeeping club here in L.A. And um, instead of ma mail ordering bees, what uh, he does is he runs a bee removal service and then saves the bees and then populates people's hives like amateur 
gatekeepers. And so we uh, fortunately or, or unfortunately had a whole bunch of bees in our rafters of, of the house we live here in here in Los Angeles. And so Kirk and I got the bees out and put them into the into a beehive in my backyard. And it was hard to keep them in there. They they left. And so we had to get more bees and, and uh, put them in. And uh, they uh, they finally took, but they it, it took a while so they didn't make honey. And so finally, I started getting honey after the book. And then once I got the honey, it was like, oh, this is amazing. And people were telling me like it was the best honey that they've ever tasted. And um, I ended up realizing how much fun it is to be a beekeeper and to give honey away to people and use the wax for various products that we make. And it's something also that my daughters really enjoy. We just uh, this summer harvested about a gallon of honey, wow. which doesn't seem like a lot, but it, it uh, lasts a long time, especially because what I'll do is I, I put it in little tiny glass jars and just give it to friends when I when they come over to visit or I go to see them. It makes a great little gift to do that. So that that was like a, a great experience, and uh, I hope we will have those bees for many years. And it's also great for the environment, right? Because I guess there's a, a bee shortage going on. Yeah, the, the colony collapse yeah. disorder, which no one, there's a lot of theories about why, and it could be a, a combination of several factors, the way that people treat bee mites, which is a parasite problem. These little mites get on bees, and um, the fact that uh, there's kind of a monoculture of bees where people are mail order bees and there's not enough diversity and then pesticides and all those kinds of things. So the beekeeping club I belong to is called Backward Beekeepers. And we do everything kind of backwards uh, c- compared to most beekeepers. It's, <laughs> it's, there's no chemical treatments. We really just kind of let the bees be bees. And um, it's almost like the less you bother them, the happier they are. You just provide them with a nice place to to live mm-hmm. and let them be bees. And that uh, has, once I finally, once they finally took it, that's been a, a great, a great way to do it. So you are, so you're still beekeeping. Are there any, other, yes. are there any other projects that you, you know, you started uh, that you talked about in the book that you're still doing today? Uh, yeah, I, I really like fermented foods. I think that uh, besides tasting really good, there's, there's health benefits, the, the oh, yeah. kind of, probiotic aspects of them. So making sauerkraut and yogurt is not only a, a fun thing to do and and really pretty easy to do, but it's actually one um, do-it-yourself kind of pursuit where it actually will save you money. There's a lot of DIY things that are much more expensive than, than uh, buying something. Like if you wanted to make your own TV or your own MP3 player or something, it would cost you... 10 times as much as it would to buy something. But with, with uh, yogurt and especially sauerkraut, you can make it for a fraction of how much you would pay for it in a store. And then you also know what's going into it and you can age it the right amount. And just a really, I highly recommend doing those things yourself. Yeah. When I read that, I was like, I need to get started on this because I, yeah. I, I love sauerkraut. Yeah, it's great. And I just, I, I have it sitting on my, desk right now some some yogurt culture that uh makes yogurt at room temperature so that you don't need to heat it up you know oh, some wow. people buy like heating blankets or special like little incubation um devices which i had been using but i, I want to try this um uh you know you just set it on your shelf set set the milk on your shelf with, with a starter and then once you use the starter that's it you don't have to keep buying more starter you can just use the the old yogurt to make new yogurt. So it's going to be fun to see how, how it turns out. That's awesome. Okay. So Mark, a lot of, you know, on our website, we, we do some DIY stuff, um, articles every now and then, and we get a lot of young men who are just really keyed in on this. Like they're just, they're really interested. Um, but what's interesting is like when I talk to my dad or talk to my, my grandpa, who's like 94, um, it seems like a lot of this DIY stuff, right? Like how to fix things or how to, make your own food or how to process, you know, your own deer that you might've hunted. It was that sort of information, that sort of knowledge seemed like it was just naturally passed down to them. Like they just, 
I don't know. I guess the way things, the way we were as a society 40, 50 years ago, it just, that information just got passed down naturally. But nowadays it just seems like younger generations just don't get that sort of stuff. Um, why do you think that is? Why do you think younger generations lack DIY skills? Well, I, I think um, looking pretty far back, like over 100 years ago, in 1900, 80% of Americans either lived full time on farms or they worked every day on farms and lived in a very rural area. And to, to be a farm worker or a farmer, you really have to be a, a jack of all trades. You have to like, be really good at fixing and maintaining farm machinery and be really um, innovative and resourceful in coming up with ways to, to make new machinery and all that kind of stuff. So every farm had a working machine shop and wood shop on the premises. So people, 80% of Americans were, were really good at making things. And then if you compare today, only 2% of Americans live and work on farms. So I think that's, that's a big thing. Um, we don't need to, we don't need to make or fix our own stuff. Even, you know, people in the 50s who were repairing their own TV sets by pulling the back off and taking the tubes out had that kind of uh, mindset that the world was something that presented problems that they could solve as individuals. Today, we really focus hard on these kind of hermetically sealed solutions to everything. And if something goes wrong, the answer is either buy one or call someone to come over to repair it for you. And so that, that, that's made people, um, uh, you know, unable to, to make anything. And so for, for us, for my generation and, and people younger than me, the idea of making things is kind of novel and it, uh, is, is, uh, you know, once you rediscover how how great it is to do that kind of thing, you want to kind of shout it from the rooftop. And I think that's like what Make Magazine does, and what my book is is like, hey, everybody, this is really cool. You know, yeah. your your father and grandfather and mother and grandmother were doing this kind of stuff, and they had to do it. Um, you don't have to do it, but really, you should look into it because there's something that you get out of it that that you can't. Uh, you know, it's an, an experience and and a, a feeling of, of fulfillment that you can't replicate any other way. Yeah, and it's also very countercultural in a lot of ways. You know, we have a very consumer culture, um, but uh, doing things by hand uh, just totally cuts against the grain um, against that that pervasive culture we have in our society. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so what? But what do you think? Um, keeps people from trying to make things by hand. Cause I know a lot, you hear a lot of people talk about it. Like they talk wistfully about, Oh, you know, I, I want to become a, a craftsman and make, you know, these wonderful handmade goods, or I want to, I want to, you know, change the oil on my car. But a lot of times they never get around to doing it from your experience. What do you think is the biggest thing that holds people back from trying to do things by hand? I think that people have been trained to avoid making mistakes as much as, or, or not avoid, but uh, they've been trained to fear mis mistakes to the point where they don't want to take anything new on because um, they're afraid they might make a mistake. And as soon as they do make a mistake, they quickly lose interest and get discouraged from, from doing that anymore. And I think one of the reasons for that is that schools train people that, uh, mistakes are something to be avoided because when you make a mistake in school, you get a bad grade. So you learn from childhood that mistakes are bad. So if you are doing something and you make a mistake, you think, I don't want to do that anymore. It's just like wired into you. But the fact of the matter is that mistakes are a really important way to learn. And that the, the makers that I've met, excuse me, the makers I've met who are like, what, who I consider alpha makers who are really good at making stuff, the thing that is different from them and the rest of the population isn't that they have a lot of skills. 
the, the true important difference is that they have learned to accept and even embrace mistakes as part of the process of creating things. And they don't go out and intentionally try to make mistakes, but they know that mistakes are going to be made, that they're going to make mistakes, and that they're going to use them as ways to learn and as sources of inspiration and creativity. And so that was something that I, I learned through the process of, of doing this stuff, is that mistakes are, are okay. And um, I actually now kind of build that into whatever I am making that I think, all right, this is just going to be the, the <laughs> first time I make something. And it's, I'll probably have to do it four times before it's good enough for me to, to use and, and keep as a permanent thing or write about. And it's fine. It's, it's like, don't expect something to be perfect the first time you do it. And um, that, that has been like a, a big uh, perception changer for me. And I'm sure that's, that carries over to other areas of life uh, as well. Your, your, maybe your work, uh, your family, I mean, even yourself. I mean, I guess maybe you're not as hard as in your, on yourself when you do screw up in some other aspect of like personal development saying, look, you know, I'm a, this is a process. Okay, take that mistake, get some feedback, learn from it, and move on. Yeah, definitely. It's that that's it's such a great attitude to have. Is thinking, you know, I made a mistake, and what did I learn from it, and how am I going to do things differently? What what did this mistake teach me? That's awesome. and and yeah, and so yeah, just not equating a mistake with failure. The only time you fail is if the mistake discourages you to the point where you give up. Yeah. I, I've had instances where I tried to, I, had, I took on some DIY projects and yeah, I, 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 I messed up on the, I, what I was trying, here's this one that I, I, it comes to mind was I wanted to make a teleprompter, uh, for my DSLR. Cause I, I do YouTube videos and mm-hmm. I'm really bad about, you know, just kind of talking off the cuff. So I wanted a teleprompter and I, I found some instructions online, how you can make this teleprompter with wood, with some like, uh, picture frames and a few pieces of wood and a piece of glass. And I remember I got into, it, I was really excited. And then I just, I totally biffed it up and it wasn't salvageable. And I had, I'd have to go back to home Depot and get some more supplies. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'll just go and find one and buy it instead. Um, and so, yeah, I really feel kind of ashamed that I did, <laughs> did that, you know, that I gave up on it. Cause it's like the, the ruins of this project are like in my little, in my garage in a corner, just sitting there Every time I walk by, it sort of mocks, you know, laughs at me. <laughs> well, another thing, you know, that, that I learned also is that you, you have to um, keep in mind the, the level of complexity of a project that you're taking on, what works with the amount of time that you have, if you have kids or not, um, if it works with, uh, you know, the, the space that you, you have, the tools that you have. And sometimes those things aren't right. And you can always go back to them um, and set your sights on a project that is man- manageable and challenges you at a, at, at a level that is appropriate for your uh, current skill level and, um, in, in, and environment. So I, I, I think I probably, I probably did bite off more than I could chew. So I guess being humble uh, is an important aspect of the DIY yeah, ethos. definitely. You know, see yourself for what, see the skills for, you know, see yourself as, as you really are, not as what you want to be. Um, okay. So here's another, like whenever we publish a DIY article, like how to build something or how to make something yourself or how to fix something in your house, uh, in the comments, a common, uh, complaint or a common question we get is, you know, people say that, oh, it's a waste of time and money to do things yourself, you know, just pay for it. Um, you know, time is better spent doing something else. You could be working on a side project that actually earns you money instead of, you know, spending time fixing a, patching a hole in your drywall. Um, how do you respond to those people who say that DIY is a waste of time and money? Well, you know, I I think in most cases they're, they're right about the money. It, It costs more money to to do something yourself than, than it does to buy it. And that wasn't always true, but it is true now. So when, we, when uh, I became a, a chicken farmer, small-scale chicken farmer with six chickens, 
the amount of time and money I spent building a chicken coop and then taking care of the chickens and stuff, those were the most expensive eggs that I've ever bought. And so they're right (laughs) on on that level. But then the thing is, like the, the eggs that I did get, I appreciated so much. And the the joy it brought me to to work with the chickens and collect the eggs and have my kids collect the eggs was was really worth every penny that I spent. It, if if you get involved in something, you care about it so much more. You know, if you build your own chair, th- th- there's a lot of things that happen. You could probably buy a, a nice chair for less money than than a chair that you built yourself, and it. It might even look better. But if you build that chair, you're going to take care of it and maintain it because it's your chair. If it breaks, you know how to fix it. Um, it makes you more observant uh, of the world around you. You start looking at how other chairs are put together and how they're fastened. And, oh, how did that guy design? How, how did they join the, the wood there? Um, that level, you know, seeing the world with new eyes is really really great. And it also, one of the cool, the best things about it is it makes you appreciate how, how skilled and artistic uh, other people are. When you see a beautifully built chair, it makes you appreciate it on a completely new level before you wouldn't have even noticed that or thought about it. So is that a waste of time and money to build a chair if you gain all of that uh, kind of new awareness? For some people, maybe, but for me, it, it's very much worth it. I'm there with you totally on that. Um, Mark, how, so I think you've mentioned it throughout our conversation, but how has becoming a tinkerer or a DIYer uh, made you a better man in other areas of your life? Um, I feel that it has given me the the uh, courage to take on all sorts of challenges that I would have uh, either avoided or outsourced in the past. So um, I, I think that that level of, of uh, confidence that it's given me in all aspects of my life has really helped a lot. You know, I, I feel like um, once I started kind of changing the world around me, I looked at myself and, and decided to do something about my kind of sedentary lifestyle with a, with a not very good diet and started really researching ways to exercise and stay fit and the kinds of foods to eat and improving my sleep and all those kinds of things. And I think I've, I've really improved my, my health quite a bit. I've, I've lost a lot of weight. I think I've gained a lot of, uh, I've become much, much leaner than I was. And that just helps me feel, uh, you know, stronger and healthier and better able to take care of my, my wife and kids too. When, when you feel good mentally and physically like that, you're able to work harder and work smarter. And uh, I think it, it's good for the whole family. That's awesome. Do you, do you feel like um, you mentioned, when you're, when you're on the island with your family, that you lost that social, that social network, has becoming a DIYer like expanded your social network in some, in some ways? Yeah, it, it definitely has because um, I, uh, one of the cool things about the, the maker movement is that you have seen the, the rise of, of uh, they're called maker spaces or hacker spaces. Yeah. They're places where people like chip in a little bit of money every month, $50 or so. And they get access to a room full of t- tools and equipment. And then most importantly, they get access to other people who are also into making. And so I will uh, go to these places whenever I travel. And there's, there's one here in L.A. called Crash Space. And it's great hanging out with them and learning from them. And uh, I pick up so many ideas from what they have to say and have made friends with, with these folks. So... Uh, I think the, the social network aspect of making is one of the most important things. Every year we have something called Maker Fair, and we have one in New York and one in San Mateo near San Francisco. There are two official ones, and the one in San Mateo gets like 120,000 people a year. Wow. And 
they love the big thing is you know talking and hanging out with each other and seeing what other people have made and learning from them and lots of deals are made and lots of collaborations are formed there and then there are mini maker fairs that have attendance of you know 10 20,000 all over the world so making is a very uh, big social you know the social aspect of of being a maker is huge that's awesome. there's the, one of those mini maker fairs are actually is coming to Tulsa uh, oh, cool. So yeah, I, me and my brother-in-law, we're going to go check it out. We're really excited. Oh, good. So, well, Mark, do you have any final bits of advice um, to our listeners who are, you know, they want to do this, like they want to become a, a tinker, they want to become a DIYer. Um, any final bits of advice for them to help them get started? Yeah, I, I would say like, you know, my, my particular interest in when I wrote the book um, Made by Hand was that I thought that food would be a, a good project for me because you know, A, I like to eat, uh, and it's something that I do three times a day. <laughs> and so having, uh, g- getting involved with that would have a, a pretty profound effect on my, my life. So my advice would be to find something you're passionate about. So, you know, say you're interested in, in music, look into DIY music, making your own musical instruments or making your own recording studio. It's got to be something that you are interested in and that is going to uh, have lasting value. You know, I, I have friends who are into robotics and make really cool robots. I personally would not be that interested in doing it because I, I might have fun making the robot and everything. And then, but once you're done, you have this a robot, and I'm like, <laughs> okay, you know, it's going to kind of walk around and avoid the walls. But I, I would play with it for 15 minutes, and then it would go in the closet. So find something you're passionate about. And then the other thing I would say is find, figure out an appropriate appropriate challenge level. If you aim too high, you're going to get discouraged and, and abandon it. And if you aim too low, you're going to get bored. And so um, uh, the, uh, Michael Csikszentmihalyi wrote a book called Flow, mm-hmm. which you probably heard about, where he talks about this state where you are sufficiently challenged by something that you become engrossed in it. And you don't even, if you're hungry, you don't think about eating. If you're tired, you don't think about sleeping. You're just like, this is all I want to do. I don't want to do anything else. Um, find that and do it. Very good. Well, Mark, it's been a pleasure. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much um, for your time. You bet, Brad. Thanks a lot. It was really fun talking with you. Our guest today was Mark Fraunfelder. He is the author of the book Made by Hands, Searching for Meaning in a Throwaway World. And you can find his book on Amazon.com. <laughs> Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. And until next time, stay manly. Stay manly.